This is the seventh lecture on cryogenic engineering under the NPTEL program. What we are studying right now is the properties of materials at low temperature. This topic we have been studying since last two lectures and this is the third and the last lecture covering this topic. We have been covering various properties under different subheadings, mechanical properties at low temperature, thermal properties of low temperature, the electrical properties at low temperature and finally, the magnetic properties at low temperature. The first two properties, the mechanical and the thermal properties are very, very important for you. When I say you means the students of mechanical engineering. At the same time, electrical properties are also important, but these properties, the electrical properties and the magnetic properties, I am going to cover under the section of superconductivity, because superconductivity is a very important aspect of cryogenics. In fact, cryogenics is the cause and the superconductivity is the effect. And here I will cover some basics of superconductivity under the section of electrical and magnetic properties at low temperature for any material. In the last lecture, I emphasis more on the thermal properties and before that lecture, I had talked about mechanical properties. So, during the last lecture, I introduced you to various material properties with reference more to the thermal properties and what we covered under thermal properties were thermal expansion and contraction at low temperature, the specific heats of solids and we covered Debye theory, we talked about Debye function, we talked about thermal conductivity of solids and how the thermal conductivity varies at low temperature. In addition to that, we talked about integral KDT that is KDT integrals which basically takes into consideration the thermal conductivity variations with temperature, especially at low temperature and also we talked about electrical resistivity of solids at low temperature. This was what we covered during the last lecture. In the present lecture, I am continuing with the material properties at low temperature, but my focus here is basically going to be superconductivity, which is a phenomena which one comes across only at low temperature and what it is, how it happens, what are the effects of all these things we can see and also I will show some video which show some very peculiar effects at low temperature. Now, based on all the lectures what we have had under this topic, I am going to solve some problems under this tutorial section. I am going to solve around 3 to 4 problems on different properties, how to calculate those properties at low temperature. And finally, I would like to give you some assignments and I will expect that all of you spend time and solve these assignments. And broadly on whatever I have covered under the topic of properties of material at low temperature, I will draw some conclusions covering all my total three lectures under this topic. As you all know, we have seen a video which shows that the properties of material change and change drastically when cooled to cryogenic temperatures. All right. If you recall the video of liquid nitrogen and we had put some materials like rubber, like potato, we had put because those materials were available to us, we showed what happened to those materials at low temperature. The electrical resistance of a conductor decreases as the temperature decreases. The resistance decreases and the material becomes more and more conductive, electrically conductive and finally, it becomes superconductive. For example, the wires made of materials like niobium titanium, this is a alloy niobium and titanium, it exhibits zero resistance when subjected to liquid helium temperatures. So, a material like this if it is subjected to very low temperature as low as liquid helium temperature that means 4.2 Kelvin, it becomes superconducting. So, let us see a behavior of how the electrical resistance changes at low temperature. So, this particular graph shows the electrical resistance of metals decrease with the decrease in the temperature. You can see a general behavior of these metals. Some of the metals become superconducting and suddenly the resistance become equal to 0 at critical temperature. Now, some of the materials become superconducting, all right. So, few of the materials when cooled to lower temperatures, the resistance suddenly drops to 0 at a particular temperature. This is what is shown by this particular graph. So, here you can see that as soon as the material starts getting cooled at a particular temperature, see it resistance decrease gradually, but at this particular temperature, the resistance suddenly become equal to 0 and this particular temperature what we call as critical temperature. Suddenly, the resistance becomes 0 and the material becomes superconducting at this point. 
all right so this is a phenomena or this is a behavior which is shown by a superconducting material that as soon as it hits the value of tc as soon as the temperature comes to tc the material has become superconducting that means its electrical resistance has become equal to zero now in 1911 kemmerling onas from holland discovered the phenomenon of superconductivity and what he did is all shown here he used basically mercury then and when mercury's temperature was decreased at a particular temperature let's say equal to 4.2 kelvin temperature its resistance suddenly become equal to zero it suddenly came down from this value to zero and this is where he understood that some of the properties have drastically changed as far as mercury was considered and then he said that mercury has become superconducting as its resistance became equal to zero at 4.2 kelvin during his investigation on mercury he observed that the resistance dropped to zero at 4.2 k so tc of mercury can be called as 4.2 kelvin so what is superconductivity this particular graph in three dimension shows that these are three axes one is a temperature axis one is a current density axis and one, one is a magnetic field axis we say that the state of a superconducting material is governed by three parameters what are those three parameters they are temperature current density and magnetic field as shown in this figure so the blue section what we show is a superconductivity region as long as the material is in this blue section in terms of all these three axis parameter that is temperature current density jc and the magnetic field hc if they are in this region the material always remains in superconducting state however if any of these parameters exceeds for example the temperature goes beyond this tc or the current density exceeds this jc value or similarly the magnetic field exceeds this hc value they are all the critical values if any material exceeds this value the material ceases to be a superconducting material it will not show the superconductivity phenomena anymore and therefore the superconductivity phenomena is shown as far as the temperature is less than tc the current density is less than jc and the magnetic field is less than hc which are all the three critical parameters so that the material remains in superconducting state so here the blue region in the figure is enclosed by tc jc and hc if i say that jc is equal to 0 hc is equal to 0 that means the material temperature has to be less than tc in order that it remains in a superconducting state so one has to go on lowering the temperature so that the material becomes a superconducting material all right so this is a very important parameters that if a material is superconductivity the current density cannot exceed jc as soon as one of the parameters is violated the material ceases to be a superconducting material now why does this happen let's understand what are the reasons that material becomes superconductive in brief the electrical resistance is due to the scattering of electron motion as you know every material has got free electrons the resistance to the flow of electrons is basically due to scattering that is inside the material and that scattering is happening through the lattice imperfection because of the existence of lattice imperfections like presence of impurity and dislocations electrons move in a material but it will come across presence of impurity it will come across dislocation and the electrons may get scattered all right and this is what offers the resistance to the flow of electrons the first imperfection that is the presence of impurity is a temperature independent parameter so whatever impurity is present in the material presents all through irrespective of the temperature while the scattering phenomena occurring due to the lattice imperfection decreases with the decrease in temperature what does it mean at lower and lower temperature the scattering phenomena is going to get less and less all right and therefore the resistance to the flow of the electrons is going to be less and less all right this is what we the analogy shows that at lower and lower temperature because the scattering phenomena is going to be decreasing the resistance to the flow of the electrons is going to be decreasing as a result the electrical conductivity when the resistance is decreasing the electrical conductivity is more at low temperature the simple argument to show that at lower and lower temperature electrical conductivity of the material increases now why does the material become superconductivity we understood the fact that conductivity increases electrical conductivity increases but bardeen cooper and schrefer put forth a theory that 
not only that the electrical conductivity increases, but some of the materials become superconducting at low temperature. And this is called as BCS theory named after Pardin, Cooper and Schrieffer. So, electrons being negatively charged particles, they move easily through the space between the adjacent rows of positively charged ions. As in every material, we have got positively charged ions and the electrons flows through the positively charged ions. This motion is assisted by electrostatic force which pulls the electron forward. Because of the attractive force between the positively charged electron ions and the electrons which are basically forming an electron cloud, the electrons move by the electrostatic force which pulls the electron inward. However, in the superconducting state, the electrons interact with each other and they form a pair. This is what happens at very, very low temperature below the critical temperature of any particular material, the two electrons come together and they form a pair. In fact, one electron pulls the other electron and that is why we call it, it becomes a pair. And this pairing is a low energy process basically and it is a stable process, right. Every low energy process is basically a stabilized process and therefore, formation of electron pair is a low energy process and this is called as phonon interaction. This is what put forth by the BCS theory. So, as soon as the electrons form a pair, the motion of the electrons is favored. The motion of the electrons is now more and more conducting. The electron pair so form, they move easily and the second electron follows the first electron during the motion. As I said, one of the electrons will pull the other electron and this results in increased motion of electrons. As a result, this electron pair traveling together encounters less resistance. This is clear from this. This electron pair is called as Cooper pair. This is one of the highlight of the BCS theory and this is what makes the material superconducting and therefore, it can carry more and more current in a superconducting state. This theory was first explained by Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer, BCS in BCS theory in the year 1957 and for which they are awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1972 for this theory. Right. This is some of the basics of the superconductivity and the BCS theory. We are not going to go in the details of this theory. Now, here you understand how the material behaves at low temperature and how the relation for different material with respect to the magnetic field and the temperature as shown in this figure. So, what you can see that on the y axis what you have got is the magnetic field strength, on x axis what you have got a temperature for different materials like tantalum, lead, tin and aluminum. If you see it for lead for example, at no magnetic field, the T c is around 6.5. Similarly, for aluminum, the T c is around 1. But as soon as you got a magnetic field, the behavior is like this. That means, at this particular magnetic field, the corresponding T c value is less than what it was earlier at 0 magnetic field. All right? So, this basically gives a reason how the magnetic field strength increases at lowering of temperature. At a particular T c value, it has strength of only 0 magnetic field, but as soon as the temperature decreases below the T c value, ma magnetic field strength increases and the maximum value is at 0 Kelvin. So, for every material, the magnetic field strength is maximum at 0 Kelvin. So, what is the relation between this threshold field H t and its temperature? This is the relationship. H t is equal to H 0 in the bracket 1 minus T upon T 0 square. So, H t is a field strength at any temperature T while H 0 we can see H 0 is the critical field at 0 Kelvin. So, H 0 for different material is what it is on y axis. Okay? At 0 Kelvin, whatever field is there it is called as H 0 and T 0 is the critical temperature at 0 that means the critical temperature T 0 is these values or what we call earlier at T c or critical temperature. So, if I want to see what is H t value at T is equal to T 0. Right. As you know, this is the T 0 value. So, if I put at H t at T is equal to T 0, if I put T 0 value here, then 1 minus 1 and the value of H t at T is equal to T 0 is nothing but 0, which is what is shown in this figure. All right. So, basically at H t is equal to 0, the value of T is equal to T 0, which is what comes from this formula. So, if I want to find out what is the value of H t at any temperature, let us say 5 Kelvin, I just put this value T is equal to 5 over here corresponding T o value is around 6.5 and I know the value of H o which is around 850 for example, I can calculate what is the field strength 
at temperature equal to 5 Kelvin in that case. Now, there are different materials like high TC and low TC materials. Some materials show high critical temperature while some materials show low critical temperature. So, superconducting materials are distinguished depending on the critical temperature they exhibit. Earlier, these materials having transition temperature above 30 Kelvin were called as high TC material. Nowadays, mostly the materials which use liquid nitrogen for their superconductivity are termed as HTS materials, while below that particular temperature other materials are called as low T C material. So, what are these materials? Here you can see a graph again on the x axis you got a lot of material with the year with the discoveries and on the y axis what you see is their T C. So, you can see that H G was discovered, mercury was discovered as superconducting in 1911 by Kamerling Onus. Niobium titanium has a T C of around 7 or 8 Kelvin, which was discovered somewhere in 1930s. Niobium tin was discovered later around 1950s, all right, and these are all called as LTS, that means low T C material, low T C superconducting material, while what you have above those is high T C material. So, previously, as we said, previously this division line was at 30 Kelvin, but nowadays it has become 77 Kelvin. So, all the materials above these are normally called as HTS material, all the materials here are called as low T C material or LTS material. The material to be talked about more at HTS are normally the copper oxide conductors, while well, these are normally the metallic conductors, all right. And the materials to be called as bismuth based, yttrium based. These are called as BISCO and they are called YBCO. These are the two highly used materials, high TC material in manufacturing of current leads or something like that or the windings if you want to have for high TC superconducting magnet materials. All right. So, these are basically high TC material or HTS material or these are LTS material. Now, we will see the phenomena of Meissner effect. This phenomena is shown by a superconducting material. So, what you see in this particular effect is at room temperature, if a material is subjected to magnetic flux, so this is basically a material at room temperature and if it is subjected to magnetic flux, the flux lines of force penetrate to the material as shown in this figure. However, as soon as this material becomes superconducting, that means it is subjected to low temperature and the material becomes superconducting, it repels the magnetic flux line. So, what happens to it? It behaves in a different way and it behaves like this all the magnetic flux line which were passing through the material earlier are no more passing through the materials and they are going outside the material and because they are repelled by the because of the superconducting material. Now, this phenomena or this effect is what is called as Meissner effect and was discovered first discovered by Meissner and Robert in the year 1933. So, the phenomena in which the magnetic flux is repelled as soon as the material becomes superconducting is now used for various end applications. What I am going to show you right now is a small video to show this effect, so that you understand this effect in a better way. Right. In this video now, what you are seeing is that are two parts, one is a magnet which is N D F E B, neodymium iron boron, okay. this is standard magnet and what you see here is basically a superconducting material. So, the base of this what you are seeing here is a YBCO material having a T C of around 95 Kelvin and what you see around that is a plastic container. Basically, it is a plastic container and the superconducting material forms the base of this material. So, what I am going to do is put this YBCO container on the magnet and as you can see it is sitting perfectly all right. This is at room temperature. So, you can understand that YBCO is not in a superconducting state right now. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to see basically how it behaves as soon as it becomes superconducting. So, what should I do? In order to make it superconducting, I can pour liquid nitrogen inside this. The liquid nitrogen will bring its temperature down to 77 Kelvin and as I said the TC of this particular material is around 95 Kelvin. That means, definitely at 77 Kelvin it, it will become a superconducting material. Now, let us see how it behaves. It shows the Meissner effect the material will start repelling the magnetic flux line. So, now let us bring it nearer to this and now what you can see suddenly is a whatever flux lines were passing through the YBCO material, it is not letting it pass now through it. 
and because now I am putting a pressure on it, it is creating a back force and the magnet is trying to go away because Y B C is trying to repel this magnetic flux line to pass through it. All right. So, this effect basically shows that as soon as the material becomes superconducting, it repels the magnetic flux. Now, this leads to the application of Meissner effect, which is a magnetical levitation train or a maglev. So, maglev train runs on the principle of magnetic levitation. When YBCO is cooled to temperatures less than 90 Kelvin, it turns diamagnetic. All right. The proper balancing of the vessel as shown in the video levitate it from the magnetic track. Now, this is what we will see. Using the same principle, maglev train gets levitated from the guide way. This results in no contact motion and therefore, no friction. Now, the same principle what we saw in Meissner effect, I will show in a application in the terms of maglev. Right. So, in this video now, what you see is a the NDFEB magnets basically are laid down as track. So, you got magnetic track, you can say that the train should move on this. Okay. You must have seen this in some kind of toys earlier. Now, what I am going to show here is how the levitation takes place. So, the YBCO magnet container what we saw earlier is kept here and it is now the liquid nitrogen is put in that and it is already kept over there on the track with some kind of material in between. right? So, let us say the train is already standing on the track over here. All right. As soon as now the material becomes superconducting, it will start floating because the magnetic flux lines are now repelling and which kind of produces a force and therefore, the material starts floating on the trains, sorry floating on the rails over here. So, what are you getting from here? You are getting a lift. Thus, this particular train or material is floating or levitating on the rails, which means there is a lift which the train obtained. And if you give a push to this now, it, can, it is a kind of a propulsive force because of will the train will start moving. So, basically now you can see that the propulsive force is given by some kind of engine. Well, let us not talk about that, but the levitation basically makes the train float on the train on the rails. Now, it will cease to be a superconducting material with the passage of time because nitrogen will get evaporated and as soon as the material ceases to be a superconducting material, it will become a normal material and the Meissner effect will come to standstill and this is what happens right now. All right. As soon as the temperature of YBC is more than 90 or 95 Kelvin, the material is no more in a superconducting state and now it has sat down. So, this particular kind of motion does not result in any contact and therefore, the frictions will be absolutely minimum and this is the principle of magnetically levitated train. Now, the similar applications are there for superconductivity and possibly we have discussed that in the first lecture and one of them is a NMR, the nuclear magnetic resonance NMR apparatus which is a magnet over here and it is kept dipped in liquid helium and liquid helium is surrounded by liquid nitrogen. So, this is what it becomes superconducting magnet at low temperature, it results in nuclear magnetic resonance. One can do NMR of any sample which is kept at the center of this magnet and similarly, what you have is a MRI. MRI magnet also is kept dipped in liquid helium surrounded by liquid nitrogen or a cryocooler cooled shields, so that the body scanning could be done. As one can see the internal details of body here in this case and one can see the internal material details in the case of NMR. These are very, very well known usages of superconducting magnet as we saw earlier. All, right. All the windings in this case are made of niobium titanium and niobium tin depending on the magnetic field strength. Now, what I am going to do in this remaining time is to solve some problems under this tutorial section. We have seen various properties till now and each property has got some uh, way to calculate the property variations at low temperature. Now, in these tutorials, I want to solve some of the problems so that we can calculate these properties at low temperature. I am going to have four tutorial problems. One is on a thermal expansion and contraction. So, one tutorial on that. Then we have got an estimation of specific capacity using Debye theory. We have got two tutorials on that. And finally, we have got thermal conductivity of materials at low temperature 
we can calculate the value of k or the loss due to k at low temperature and we got one tutorial on that. Okay, so, tutorial number 1, the problem statement is calculate the overlap length of a braised lap joint formed by two materials, one is SS304 and the other one is copper. The SS length of L0 or length at 0 Kelvin is given as 1 meter, while copper the length is 0.5 meter. Now, it is desired minimum overlap should be greater than 5 millimeter. The joint is subjected to low temperature of 80 Kelvin and following data, data could be used. So, the problem statement says that you make a joint and the joint is made at naturally at room temperature which is at 300 Kelvin. However, this joint is going to be subjected during operation to a temperature of 80 Kelvin and therefore, what you know is the shrinkage will happen. The statement also says that the overlap should be of these two material should be greater than 5 millimeter at low temperature because the shrinkage would happen at low temperature and the overlap will decrease at low temperature and therefore, what should be the overlap at room temperature in effect that is basically the question. So, what you can see here is a problem statement that at 80 Kelvin condition this is a SS material, this is a copper material, both the lengths are given as 1 meter and 0.5 meter respectively. What is the problem? The problem is that at 80 Kelvin this overlap of material should be more than equal to 5 millimeter. So, it should basically be more than 5 millimeter so that it has got good strength. The data is given at 300 Kelvin and at a Kelvin, so del L by L 0. We have seen this behavior of mean linear thermal expansion. The values for S s and the value of copper are given as this. All right, at 300 Kelvin it is 304, at 80 Kelvin it is 13 and at copper for copper it is 337 and 26. So, what we are going to do basically is calculate shrinkage of S s at 80 Kelvin calculate shrinkage of copper at 80 Kelvin and then based on that, based on the relative shrinkages, we should calculate what should be the overlap at room temperature. Let us divide into two parts, one for SS304 and one for the copper. Getting the values from the data, that is the mean linear expansion in SS304 is del L by L0 is LT1 by L0 minus LT2 by L0 into 10 to the power minus 5. This is what we get, this is what we have seen. See, if I put the values of L T 1 by L 0 at T 1 temperature, which is in this case is 300 Kelvin and T 2 temperature, which is in this case is 80 Kelvin. Okay. See, if I put those values, what I get? Del L S S by L 0 is equal to 304 minus 13. 304 is the value at 300 Kelvin, 13 is the value at 80 Kelvin. If I take L 0 as 1 meter, which is what the problem says, delta L S S will be 2.91 millimeter. If the material is going to be subjected from 300 Kelvin to 80 Kelvin for a length of 1 meter, the shrinkage would be 2.91 millimeter as far as S S 304 is considered. For copper, if you do the similar calculation, we have got del L C U by L 0 is equal to L T 1 by L 0 minus L T 2 by L 0. L T 1 by L 0 for copper is 337 at 300 Kelvin, L T 2 by L 0 of copper is 26 at 80 Kelvin, but these values were meant for L 0 equal to 1 meter. So, at L 0 equal to 1 meter del L C u is going to be 3.11 millimeter, while if the length is only 0.5 meter, it will be half of that and for del L C u will be 1.55 millimeter. What does it mean? So, the shrinkage of copper will be 1.55 millimeter while the shrinkage of S s will be 2.91 millimeter when the joint is subjected to 80 Kelvin. Now, the problem says that the overlap should be more than or equal to 5 millimeter. So, I have to take the worst of the shrinkages which is 2.91. If I take that worst of the shrinkages, I should be able to calculate what should be net overlap at room temperature B. So, the greatest of the two expansions is shrinkage of stainless steel. So, the safe lap joint should be more than DLSS that is shrinkage of SS plus 5 millimeter that is 7.91 millimeter. So, if I take this as 8.1 for example, which is more than 7.91, then the lap width in copper after shrinkage will be 6.55 millimeter. Similarly, lap width in SS after that will be 8.1 minus 2.91 I think as 5.1 millimeter which means that the overlap is going to be more than 5 millimeter 
and it can stand the required strength at 80 Kelvin. So, basically the problem is to calculate the shrinkages of these two materials and see that at 80 Kelvin the joint does not fail. That means, the overlap is basically more than the minimum value of 5 millimeter. All right. This is a very practical problem and I am sure you will understand from here what are different parameters that have to be considered while designing such a joint at low temperature. Hence, the overlap being more than 5 millimeter is a good design. Second problem is Debye theory. We know in Debye theory, we got an expression for the value of specific heat capacity. So, C v is equal to 3 r T by theta d cube into a Debye function represented by d of T by theta d. The theta d is basically Debye characteristic temperature, which is known and it is a characteristic temperature for every material. Also, we know from earlier lecture that at the temperature which is more than 2 times theta d, C v approaches 3 r value, which is this coefficient over here. This is called as Dulong and Petit value, all right. And very low temperature that is T less than theta d by 12, C v is given by following equation, it reaches this value. Now, we see the problems based on both these extreme cases. At d, t is equal to 0, the constant value is 4 pi to the power 4 by 5. By 5. So, this particular curve shows the C v by r variation against t by theta d values. All right. So, this variation of C v by r versus t theta d is a cubic at low temperature and it constant at higher temperature as, as we have seen earlier. We know the theta d values for various materials and they are as given over here in the table. Now, based on this, we will solve the second tutorial. Determine the lattice specific heat of copper at 100 Kelvin. So, calculate the value of C v at 100 Kelvin for copper given that the molecular weight of copper is 63.54 gram per mole. So, the step 1 for this is basically to get the value of T by theta d. So, T is known to us which is 100 Kelvin and theta d is a characteristic day by temperature for copper, which from this table you can see that the theta d value for copper is 310. So, T by theta d for copper is 100 upon 310, which is 0 0.3225. This value of T by theta d is greater than 1 by 12 of T by theta d and therefore, what we can say now, we can basically refer to this particular graph. So, for T, theta, T by theta d to be 0 0.3225, I have to locate the value of in here and get correspondingly the value of C v by r. So, from the graph, what you see is a corresponding to 0 0.3225 of T by theta d, I get the value of C v by r, which is equal to 1.93. Once I know C v by r, I just multiply it by r and to get r, what I do? Universal gas constant divided by the weight which is given, which is 63.54 grams per mole and which gives me the value of r to be 130.85, which is a specific gas constant. So, the value of C v therefore, equal to 1.93 into 130.85 and what you get ultimately is a 252.534 joule per kg Kelvin. So, the C v of copper at T is equal to 100 Kelvin is 252 joule per kg Kelvin. Naturally, the C v of copper at 300 Kelvin is much higher and as the temperature is reducing, the value of C v is decreasing. Extending the same, I go to tutorial 3, where the problem statement is determine the lattice specific heat of aluminum at 25 Kelvin, given that the molecular weight is 27 grams per mole. So, here I am talking about aluminum and I want to calculate the value of specific heat at 25 Kelvin, it is a very low temperature. The data is given to me in terms of its molecular weight, which is a standard property. Again, going by step 1. I am going to calculate the T by theta d. So, what is T by theta d ratio for which I have to know what is the theta d value or the Debye temperature for aluminum, which is 390. The Debye temperature for aluminum is 390 and therefore, T by theta d is going to be 25 upon 390, which is 0 0.0641. Now, this T by theta d is less than 1 by 12 of theta d. So, 1 by 12 of theta d is basically 0 
So, T by theta d in this case of aluminum is 0 0.0641 and if this T by theta d is less than 1 by 12 that is 0 0.0833. So, this 0 0.0641 is less than 1 by 12 that means, we can apply a simple formula to calculate the value of C v in this case. right? Since the T by theta d ratio is less than 1 by 12, the equation to calculate the specific heat is as given below. Now, with this equation I can calculate the value of C v which is completely T by theta d dependent. We know the temperature T is 25 Kelvin in this case and T by theta d value is known to us. If we put those values for corresponding R is universal gas 8.314 divided by the grams per mole for aluminum, what you get is a specific gas constant which is 307.9 for aluminum. Putting those values over here, what you get ultimately is a value of C V which is 18.958 joule per kg Kelvin. Right? So, what you see here is the value of C V is drastically less at 25 Kelvin in this case of aluminum. In the earlier problem, what you saw first for, for copper which was a correspondingly very high value and at 25 Kelvin aluminum shows a very low value. We have studied two examples to calculate the specific heat at low temperatures for one for copper, one for aluminum. In one case we refer to the graph, in the other case we have calculated based on a available formula at low temperature. The next tutorial will be on thermal conductivity integrals. Just to revise that, the Fourier's law of heat conduction is as you know Q is equal to minus K into A into dt by dx, while k is a strong function of temperature in this case at cryogenic temperature. To make calculations less difficult and to account for the variation of k t with temperature, q is expressed as q is equal to minus g into theta 2 minus theta 1. All right? We have seen this earlier and here k d t is taken as an integral called thermal conductivity integral which takes into account the variation of k with temperature. And if I am talking about temperatures, I will talk about a range of temperature and the theta 1 and theta 2 are basically for T 1 and T 2 respectively. Both of them should have the same base of T d here. So, theta 1 is nothing but integral k d t from some datum temperature T d up to T 1 and this datum temperature could be from standard books, it could be 0 Kelvin or 4.2 Kelvin. Here, the ACS is constant, the cross section area is constant and the G is defined by ACS by length. So, what you see is a graphical variation of integral k d t in a graphical form with temperature on the x axis for different material, stainless steel, aluminum and phosphor bronze and the variation of k d t for few of the commonly materials shown over here. In the calculations, the actual temperature distribution is not required. So, if I know my T 1 is going to vary from 100 Kelvin to 20 Kelvin, 100 Kelvin to 10 Kelvin, I have to just see the end values integral k d t at 100 Kelvin, integral k d t at 10 Kelvin and the difference of these two will give me integral k d t between 100 and 10 Kelvin. All right? So, the formula is if I want to calculate integral k d t between 10 Kelvin and 100 Kelvin, I should get the value of integral k d t at 100 Kelvin which is basically taking 0 as a base minus integral k d t at 10 Kelvin again the base remaining same at 0 Kelvin. So, if I get a difference of these two values, this is nothing but integral k d t between 10 to 100 Kelvin. This is what I want to use if I want to calculate the loss due to thermal conductivity or loss due to conduction or heat transfer due to conduction if the material is subjected at one end from 100 Kelvin and the temperature at the other end is around 10 Kelvin. So, my next tutorial is based on this formation. The problem statement is determine the heat transferred in a copper slab of uniform cross section of area 1 centimeter square and length of 0.1 meter. So, the L is equal to 0.1 meter while A is equal to 1 centimeter square. When the end faces are maintained at 300 Kelvin and 80 Kelvin. So, one end of the copper slab it has 300 Kelvin, the other end is subjected to 80 Kelvin respectively. Compare the heat transferred by K average and K d t methods. So, K average is basically taking average of the K value at 300 Kelvin and the k value at 100 Kelvin, while k d t takes into consideration the k variations between 300 Kelvin and 80 Kelvin at all the points. So, let us compare these two heat transfers obtained using k average method and an integral k d t method. So, what is given to us is a copper slab, one end of the copper slab is at 300 Kelvin, the other end is at 80 Kelvin. Naturally, 
there will be heat transfer from a high temperature to the low temperature in this case, which is equal to Q. What is given to us is area of cross section A is 10 to the power minus 4 meter square, which is nothing but 1 centimeter square and the length of specimen is 0.1 meter. T 1 is equal to 300 Kelvin, while T 2 is equal to 80 Kelvin. So, let us first go by K average method, in which I will take the average value of thermal conductivity between 300 Kelvin and 80 Kelvin. So, what is K 300 is 78.5 as far as copper is considered 78.5 at 300 Kelvin and K at 80 Kelvin is 37 watt per meter Kelvin. If we take the average of these two, the K average value is going to be 57.75 watts per meter Kelvin. How do I calculate Q in this case? Q is equal to minus K into A into dt by dx. The value of K is taken as K average in this case. If I put the values over here, what I get ultimately is 57.75 into 10 to the power minus 4, which is A and this is K, T 1 minus T 2, which is nothing but dt, 300 minus 80 divided by the length, which is 0.1 meter. And the Q calculated in this way based on K average is 18.958 watts. This is based on a K average method. If I want to now calculate the same thing by using integral KDT method or a KDT method, what I should know now Q is equal to minus G into theta 2 minus theta 1. Now, the baseline here is in case 4.2. 4.2 to 300 KT dt is 15000 for copper, while theta 2 at 80 Kelvin taking base at 4.2 Kelvin is nothing but 1600. G is equal to ACS upon L, which is 10 to the power of minus 4 upon 0.1 and the Q, if I put all those values over here, I get the value of Q to be equal to 13.4 watts, which means that if I compare the two values, based on K average, I got 18.98 watts. Well, based on KDT method, I got 13.4 watts. That means, my calculations based on K average is quite higher as considered to what it is, which is a realistic picture taking all the property variations in this temperature region of 300 to 80 Kelvin region, which is just 13.4 watts and this is what I should use for actual calculations. So, K average is basically predicting more heat transfer as compared to the realistic heat transfer predicted by integral KDT method. So, we just saw several tutorials. Based on those, I am going to give assignments, which you can see calculation of specific heat, calculation of specific gas constant is given, determine the energy required to warm, calculation of Q over here. Then, specific heat of aluminum has been given at 60 Kelvin, one has to calculate specific heat over here. So, based on whatever problem we have solved in the tutorials, you have to solve these assignments. And this is calculation of the heat transfer, which we just saw. And here again, based on what we did, calculation of shrinkages, so that the overlap length is always maintained. So, please go through these assignments and solve these problems. And for all these problems, use the standard data that is available both in the literature and as given in my earlier lectures. Just to conclude what we have done till now. We know that the properties of material change when cool to low temperatures or cryogenic temperature. We have found that stainless steel is the best material for the cryogenic application from strength point of view. So, if the strength is a requirement, one should go for stainless steel only. Carbon steel cannot be used at low temperature as it undergoes a DBT transition or ductile to brittle transition. Ultimate strength and yield strength, fatigue strength of material increase at low temperature while impact strength ductility decrease at lower temperature. PTFE or Teflon, which is a non-metal, can be deformed plastically at 4 Kelvin as compared to other materials and therefore, Teflon is preferred in cryogenics. The coefficient of thermal expansion lambda decreases with the decrease in temperature. For pure metals, KT remains constant, thermal conductivity remains constant above LN2 temperature, which is 77 Kelvin. Below this temperature, it reaches a maxima and then decreases steadily. This is what we saw in the last lecture. For impure metals, KT decreases with decrease in temperature, while as we just saw in a problem, integral KDT is used to calculate the heat transfer at low temperature. We also saw that the electrical conductivity of metallic conductors increases at low temperature. That is what leads to superconductivity. Also, we saw that K e electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity are correlated by Wiedemann Franz law. Basically, K t by K e is just a function of temperature. 
the sudden drop in the resistance when a particular material is cooled to lower temperatures is called as superconductivity. This is what the phenomena we studied in this lecture. This state is governed by three parameters namely temperature, current density and magnetic field. The superconducting materials are distinguished into high T C material and low T C material depending on the critical temperatures they exhibit. We also saw that Meissner effect, maglev, superconducting magnets are some of the applications of the superconductivity. Thank you very much.